This is Brian Resney, president of Resney Wealth Management, bringing you the Resney Wealth Report. We've got a great show for you today, and as always, if you have questions, send those to Brian Resney at ResneyWealth.com. And make sure you visit our website, ResneyWealth.com. Great information. You can sign up for instant email alerts of topics we're going to talk about on future shows and or important investment topics that you should really understand. As I've always discussed, you know, the economy obviously is a fluid instrument. There's times where the economy is growing quite nicely. There's times the economy kind of stalls. And then there's times when the economy actually goes down. Of course, this year and really last year, we've had just a ton of talk about inflation. And really, you know, with, with eight to nine percent inflation the last year, year and a half, a lot of consumers are really being hit in the pocketbook. And that really does impact the overall economy in a huge way. But let's talk about inflation. Remember, inflation normally runs around two, two and a half percent in the US, at least for the last 20 or 30 years or so. Current inflation that you're seeing in the last year and a half or so has really been elevated really by bad policies by the current administration. So again, whether you're Democrat, Republican, that really doesn't matter to us. We look at policy and I just try to explain to every investor that policy does matter. And if you spend too much money or try to give away too many free things, unfortunately what ends up happening, there's too much money chasing too few goods and that's what causes inflation. But we are starting to see inflation abate a little bit. So instead of running really over 9%, we're starting to see some signs of cracks in inflation, meaning it's starting to go down. So what does that mean? Realistically, as we get into the second half of this year, you'll probably see inflation start to abate a little more. Maybe by the end of the year, we're running somewhere in the five or 6% inflation instead of a 9% inflation rate. As we get into next year, realistically, three, three and a half percent inflation might be more realistic and more of a feasible number. But we're going to see. It's going to take a little bit of time to bring this inflation in check. But ultimately, it's the rate of change of inflation. So inflation is slowing. A lot of things that contribute to inflation are starting to slow. So we see that as a longer term net positive. And again, long term to us is three years or longer. So really, you want to be positioning now for lower inflation and potentially a better economy over the next 18 to 24 months. And certainly over the next three years, we see greener pastures. There's been a ton of calls out there by a lot of the major investment firms, these Wall Street firms and banks, which by the way are almost always wrong on all their calls, but they've called for all kinds of market corrections. And, and really we've seen a lot of calls coming from our TV and radio show listeners people that are really nervous about another you know, 50% drop in the equity market. What I would say is this, we saw about a 25% correction in most of the major indices this year, 2022, and we've already recouped a major chunk of that downward draft. One of the things you gotta think about is this, if we are actually in a recession, like some people claim, well, that means that the Fed may actually be looking at reducing rates in the near future. That ultimately usually spells a positive for the equity markets and a resurgence of the economy. Or on the other hand, if the, the Fed actually has a soft landing as they claim they're trying to do, and they actually achieve a soft landing, that would also mean that the equity markets and the economy would start to have a uh, recoup and have great opportunity. So kind of either way, we're going to see more volatility this year, but I think ultimately the lows that you saw really six weeks ago or so are probably already built into the equation. The other big one is the bond market. Bonds have been hit really hard this year. I don't want to say I told you so, but I told you so. I try to educate every investor on my TV radio shows well over a year and a half ago to reduce bond exposure, raise cash, and or go to shorter term duration bonds and more high quality bonds in your portfolio. 
I know a lot of you probably didn't listen to that. Why is that? Investors basically buy investments, they hold on to those investments, they ride them down, and unfortunately they usually sell at the bottom. Bonds are no different. When rates go up, bond values go down and bonds got hit hard. If you look at the equity market, the equity market is actually down a half of what the bond market is year to date. That's pretty crazy, because a lot of investors think bonds are safe. Bonds can be as risky or riskier than the equity market from time to time, depending on interest rate cycles. So what you have to realize as an investor, your bonds are not safe investments. Bonds can default. Bonds can go down in value. Bonds can have low rates of return or negative rates of return for many, many years. So that false sense of security with bonds is probably because maybe you weren't really educated how bonds work by your current advisor. And maybe it's time you find yourself a real money manager who not only can educate you, but also can steer the ship or that bond portfolio in the correct direction based upon changes in circumstance interest rates, and the economy. The other big one is fear and greed. I want to talk a lot about that. The emotional roller coaster when it comes to investing, investors tend to be all over the board. If you don't have a real strategy, you're not level-headed, unfortunately, fear and greed are going to have an emotional roller coaster to your portfolio and really your financial security and net worth. I will tell you that we receive literally hundreds and hundreds of phone calls yearly on my TV and radio shows from people who are just distraught, fear, greed, emotional roller coaster type investors that are jumping from this to that or they just don't know what to do. So they freeze and do nothing when they should be doing something. Again, fear is a big driver, greed's a big driver. The emotional roller coaster when it comes to investing is not a good thing. And you, the investor, have to realize that if you cannot con contain those emotions, you're going to ultimately make less money, lose more, and really destruct, uh, have destructive uh, natures to your retirement and your portfolio. One of the important things as a money manager at Resident Wealth Management is that we keep those emotions out. We use logic, we lose great education, a lot of research, and you make those adjustments that when necessary, not because just because something's down. Sometimes you don't want to sell when something's down just because the overall market has come down. Sometimes you want to sell something that's down because it could go down a lot more. Sometimes you need to take a profit in certain assets or reduce exposure because it's the proper thing to do. Emotions and investing never work out and you have to keep them at bay. Number five, investors always buy more at the top and they sell at the bottom. Isn't that interesting? Investors always buy more at the top and sell more at the bottom. And why is that? Because again, no strategy, the emotions that I talked about earlier, maybe your so-called advisor at the big Wall Street firm or bank, which by the way is no more than a salesperson, is not really managing your money at all. And so what happens is you're realizing that maybe the, the risk of your portfolio may be as greater than you thought it was, or maybe it wasn't properly explained by that advisor. Because again, most of these advisors, our estimation 90%, are no more than salespeople for these Wall Street firms and banks. So really, they're not managing any money at all. They're selling you investments they're required to sell through that firm. And it might even be your brother-in-law, Bob. He's a great guy, but again, he works for that bad umbrella, Wall Street and banks are not your best friend, and they certainly are not managing your money the way that you think you really need your money managed. So at the end of the day, remember, you want to buy low, you want to sell high. There's nothing wrong with taking some money off the table, reducing risk when appropriate, but not just because something went down, but because there's better opportunity or the reason for something that you want to sell has changed substantially on the, really the research side that tells you there's better opportunity for those dollars. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back with questions after this. Hello, I'm Brian Resney, president of Resney Wealth Management. Investors are getting smart. They are moving away from conflicts, bad advice, and being sold 
junk investments from firms that are not family fiduciaries. Smart investors demand real advice and real money management 100% of the time. If you're tired of the financial runaround, download my groundbreaking report, Three Investment Risks You Must Avoid Now. And we're back, and I hope you're enjoying today's program. And again, send your questions to Brian Resney at ResneyWealth.com. And make sure you visit ResneyWealth.com, our website, for times availability of future shows. You can sign up for instant email alerts. And as I've always discussed, if you're not happy with the way your money's being managed, or maybe you're realizing your money's not really being managed at all, call Resney Wealth Management for a consultation. If you are looking for money management, if you have a larger portfolio of a million dollars and greater, and you'd like to talk to Resney Wealth Management about managing your wealth, give us a call. We can sit down with you, take a look at what you're currently doing, and see if you'd be a good fit, not only for our firm, but also that we can really help move your portfolio in the right direction. Don't go it alone. Never procrastinate. If you realize things are not right and you sense that, give Resney Wealth Management a call. Bill in Fort Myers, Florida. The real estate market seems to be dropping. Is this a repeat of 2008? How do you assess the real estate market? Bill, that's a great question. In fact, I was talking to my staff this week about the real estate market. So I, first off, I don't see this as a repeat of 2008, meaning prices dropping 50, 60, 70%, no. Remember, 2008 was really a boom and bust real estate market that was driven by over leveraged uh, investors, homeowners, people that were basically getting mortgages with, with really with no money down without having to qualify. They would just sign a mortgage application and get a big mortgage on a house they couldn't afford in the first place. And prices kept going up because banks kept lending. That is currently not in the equation in the real estate market throughout the US. So what I will say is this, anytime prices go up a little too fast, you'll usually see some kind of retracement, not the whole retracement, but actually having these prices come down in real estate is actually a net positive. It makes home ownership a little more affordable. Now remember, it's a two-prong approach. Real estate prices are coming down because they went up a little too fast, too quick, and you have real estate or interest rates on real estate type mortgages have gone up really 30 to 40% just in the last six months or so because the Fed has raised rates. What does that do? It, it's a double whammy. Real estate prices are already high, interest rates go high, of course, home affordability goes way down. So when prices come down, and ultimately if we are in a recession or the economy levels off from inflation, the Fed will probably then reduce rates again. So home ownership will come back into vogue and be more affordable, which is again, a positive. Bob in Naples, Florida. Do you think a dividend strategy is best for a conservative retiree? Bob, what I will tell you is this. There's not one strategy that you should deploy whether you're a retiree or not retired. It doesn't matter. What you want to do, think about this. I always talk about the 96 box of crayons. Remember when you were a kid in school, they had that big box of crayons? That is really the investments you have in front of you and or the various strategies. You want to have the big box of crayons in front of you. And you're going to pick the five or six crayons out of that box that are appropriate for the picture you're coloring or better put, the investment strategy currently that makes most sense given the economic climate. So again, you don't want to have one strategy, you want to basically have all strategies available, but utilize the strategies and or investment tools that make most sense given the current structure of the overall economy. I think too often investors, Bob, want to just buy high dividend stocks or just buy growth stocks or maybe just buy bonds. All of those are investment tools or strategies. Utilize the ones that are best today given the backdrop and then adjust those strategies and or portfolio as time slowly change in order to better your situation, reduce risk, lock in profit, things of that nature. 
Ryan in Cape Coral, Florida. What do you think about Alibaba? Ryan, Alibaba is a Chinese basically uh, entity for practical purposes. What I'm gonna say is this. Currently at Resney Wealth Management, we're invested mainly in the US marketplace. And why is that? Because in our opinion and our research, this is the best place to be invested currently. It's not that we're not looking at other markets around the world, it's just that those other markets are not as favorable as the US. Alibaba, because of the Chinese situation with their political regime, is really, to me, you're, you're adding double risk. You're, you're buying a stock first off that you're gonna have stock risk or company risk with, and then you throw in China with rules and regulations and how they could be taken off an exchange, or they could take the CEO and throw them in jail, all kinds of crazy stuff. I think at this point in time, it makes zero sense to buy any Chinese type investments because the risk political and the investment risk, you're double taking a double risk for really no more return. So why take more risk for no more return and certainly probably less return and bigger downdrafts in your portfolio. Stay away from Alibaba. Stay away, in my opinion, from all Chinese stocks, at least for the time being. Maybe in six months, maybe in six years, the Chinese market will be more favorable for investors. And maybe at that point, we'll be looking at, at positions in those companies. But currently, as I've always suggested, stay away from high risk areas because you can easily find areas like the US in our opinion, that have greater opportunity and less risk for your portfolio. Harry in Cape Coral, Florida. I worked for Ford for 40 years. Now retired and still own a lot of stock. What are your thoughts? Harry, first off, I don't know what a lot of stock means. Generally speaking, regardless if you worked for the company or not, you should never ever own more than 5% of any one individual stock, no matter how great you think it is, no matter if you worked for the company or not. So what I would say to you is this, I think Ford is a good company, I think it's a lousy investment long term. If you own more than 5% of Ford, I would trim your exposure down to 5% immediately. If you really like Ford and you've really done research on Ford, I would then after you get down to 5% exposure, in the next 12 months, trim your exposure down to two and a half percent. A company like Ford to me is a high risk venture. Auto companies and kind of like airlines, those are two areas of the economy that I really don't like. Let me tell you why. Auto companies in general are just huge capital intense companies. They're low margin companies. It's either feast or famine. You're in a recession, they just tank. You're out of recession, they do pretty good. Then they tank again. If you look at the long term returns of most of the car companies, they've been really, really lousy investments. You'd be better off looking at different indexes, being better diversified with your money and having a less risk portfolio Realistically, those indexes have made better returns, no guarantee to the future, but why have a lot of money tied up in one company that really has, in my opinion, not a great long-term profit future to it? Ted in Cape Coral, Florida. Are IPOs good investments? So let's explain, Ted, what an IPO is. An IPO is what's considered an initial public offering. Initial public offerings, the reason these companies go public is they usually need capital or they wanna, they wanna kinda cash out on the money they have or at least the people that started the company. They contact one of these big brokerage houses which are considered an investment bank. All these big firms you've heard of, most of them do what's called investment banking. Those firms then, those big investment firms, those big brokerage firms, charge huge money to that company who wants to IPO. There's all kinds of conflicts of interest. They then sell you, Ted, the unsuspected investor who probably didn't do your research, these IPO stocks. Most IPO stocks usually do very lousy in return the first year and usually really lousy the next five. Not all, but a lot. Now people will say, well, what about this one or that one? Sure, if, if there's 500 companies a year that IPO and five do incredibly well, are you able to pick those five? Probably not. What I suggest is never buy an IPO. But if you think you've done the research, wait till it IPOs, wait another 12 months, follow the company, do your research, and at some point maybe, if it's gonna be the next, as an example, Microsoft, then you'll still have plenty of time to buy it while it's still gonna have great growth prospects from your research long term. But generally speaking, 
IPOs are really a, a bloodbath for most investors. They're a windfall for usually the companies that are trying to cash out and get money out. And they're a windfall for the brokerage houses who are fraught with conflicts of interest that are not good for you and your portfolio. So ultimately, Ted, what I will tell you is stay away from IPOs, do a lot of research, and maybe once they're IPO 12 months after, you may want to consider nibbling on some of those. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back with more questions. Make sure you do send those to Brian Resney at ResneyWealth.com. And make sure you do visit our website, ResneyWealth.com. And as always, if you're not happy with the way your money's being managed and you've got a larger portfolio of a million dollars and greater, contact Resney Wealth Management for a consultation. We provide fee-only fiduciary money management, excellent management, excellent client communication. We take care of our clients. We want to make sure you're happy with your experience. So if you're currently questioning the results, you're currently questioning the company and the conflicts you're currently working with, it's time you stepped up and you contacted Resney Wealth Management. You will not be uh, sad you did. You will be grateful on the long-term basis. Go to ResneyWealth.com. I'll be right back. Hello, I'm Brian Resney, president of Resney Wealth Management. I've managed money professionally for over 30 years. The biggest mistake I see investors make, being sold an annuity. Annuities are sold on blatant lies, fake free money bonuses that never materialize for you, the consumer. Before your retirement gets ripped off by an annuity salesman, get my free report. Why annuities are dangerous to your wealth and retirement. And we're back with today's program and we're getting a lot of questions in. And again, if you have a question, send them to Brian Resney at ResneyWealth.com. You know, my next question comes from uh, Alec in Florida. And his question is, is it a good investment to invest in not well-known uh, cryptocurrencies? Uh, this, is a, this is a great question. First off, cryptocurrencies in general are a complete speculation. Okay, so you are basically playing the lotto, in my opinion, multiple times. If you're buying uh, less well-known cryptocurrencies, that's even more fraught, in our opinion, with more speculation and substantially more risk. You gotta remember, what is a cryptocurrency? It's a means of payment. It is not an investment. Cryptocurrencies, like a Bitcoin, you're buying nothing. You're buying nothing at all. You're buying smoke in the air that you cannot capture, okay? It's gonna evaporate over time and you're gonna lose it all. So what I will say to you is this, if you like to speculate, Go take $5 a week and go buy a lotto ticket. You probably have a better chance of making uh, get rich quick in your portfolio. Buying cryptocurrencies, it's fool's gold. Every single year, every decade, I've been managing money over 30 years. I see all kinds of gimmicky investments all the time. Cryptocurrencies are no different than limited partnerships back in the day, SPACs a couple years ago, and the list goes on and on and on. And what happens to the investor? You get taken to the woodshed and you lose all your money or most of it. What happens with the people that are selling these investments to you? They're the ones getting rich on the back of your wallet, which is never a good thing for your portfolio. So avoid cryptocurrencies. If you own them, you probably want to get rid of them as soon as you can and find real investments to invest in properly. You make money slow and methodical. If you try to speculate, you're going to lose everything and probably a lot more. Mark in Boca Raton, Florida. Brian, what is your uh, market outlook for the next six months? and the next three years. It seems there's a lot of talk on recession calls. Love your show. Thanks for the nice comment, Mark. Generally speaking, if I look at the next six months, we're gonna have normal volatility. But I like the second part of your question, which is the next three years. As an investor, think about this. Whether you're 80 years old, you're 20 years old, or you're somewhere in the middle, every investor, is a long-term investor, let me explain. So if you're 80, you're a long-term investor. If you have a million dollars and you're 80, are you gonna spend all million dollars in the next three years or less? No, you're gonna spend a fraction of that for income purposes in retirement. So the bulk of your million dollars will be invested for the next three years and the next three years after that and so on. So if I look at the next three years, 
what you're going to do is you're going to even out some of this volatility. I think there's great opportunity in the U.S. marketplace. I think there may be potentially some opportunity in certain kind of bonds when rates start coming back down. And if, in fact, we really are in a recession and the economy stalls and inflation comes back in check, the Fed will most likely then start reducing rates again, which could be potentially good for certain types of bond investments. Certainly the equity market could shine. These are all things we look at overall. But as an investor, what you have to realize is this. How you invest today is really going to give you the opportunity how really how well you're going to do the next three years. And returns are not made every month or every day. They're made over that average of that three years or more. So just kind of remember that. And if you do that the proper way, you'll be a happy camper. Doug in Alaska, my advisor went to cash four weeks ago just as the market bottomed. Not the first time he's done this. We lost a lot of the recovery. I now question his ability help. Doug, I've heard this from a lot of uh, investors who've called my TV and radio show, and I could tell you this. I have a lot of clients who hire us from these big brokerage firms and banks. Most of these advisors, of course, are not really advisors at all, and they're certainly not money managers. A lot of these advisors are more emotional, Doug, than you are, meaning they get nervous when things go down, so they actually start selling their clients' assets because they really don't have a strategy. So what I would say to you is, if your person has already done this before, and they in multiple times, how are you ever going to recoup these major losses? You have a market that comes back, you're not participating. If you try to short time, uh, time the market, generally speaking, you're going to lose every time. There are so many studies about timing the market short term and how bad investors really do. So if your advisor is trying to do this or they're acting emotional, which is really what it sounds like, ultimately it's going to hurt your portfolio and it's ultimately gonna hurt your long-term returns. Your financial security's in jeopardy. These are not good signs. Doug, what I would suggest if you have a larger portfolio, call our office on Monday, schedule a consultation to talk about our services, find out the difference, why we're different, and how we can really ultimately help you get back on track. I think too many investors procrastinate, they wait, and they, they know their advisor probably is not doing a great job, but they settle with mediocre. That's not a great investment strategy and that's not a great relationship. You know, you have one portfolio, you have one retirement. If you let these things uh, fester and if they go on for a long period of time, again, your financial security and retirement is at complete jeopardy. Folks, I'm just about out of time. As always, I wanna thank all of for all your questions. If you do have future questions, send those to Brian Resney at ResneyWealth.com. Make sure you visit ResneyWealth.com, sign up for instant email alerts. One of the things I wanna bring up to every one of you, if you're, again, you're not happy with the way your money's been managed, if you're concerned about the direction of your portfolio, call Resney Wealth Management during the week. We manage larger portfolios. We are a fee-only fiduciary money manager. Poor advice, poor client communication, feeling like you've been left out by your advisor, that's not a positive feeling. Call Rousey Wealth Management. We'd love to get you back on track. As always, real money management, real advice, 100% of the time. Make sure you do visit ResneyWealth.com. We will see you next week.